Okay, so <clears throat> then, we, then last week we had the conversation about doping silica, silicon, and getting one side of the silicon to have a bunch of atoms that will let go of an electron, and another side of the silicon doped with a bunch of atoms that would like an elect extra electron, and if you put them together, the electrons will jump. <clears throat> and then depending on how you polarize this thing, the area that's depleted of electrons will either get bigger in reverse bias or smaller in forward bias. In forward bias, they will eventually start conducting electrons at a fairly low voltage drop, maybe half a volt or 0.7 volts. In reverse bias, you're going to have to go quite a bit higher. Then if I take and put two of these junctures together, either a PN and, and, and NP, or an NP and a PN, a PN, we then make what's called a transistor. <clears throat> Ultimately, what happens is if I start taking and adding a few um, holes to here or taking a few electrons out of here, that will close both depletion zones and let a whole bunch of current co conduct across here. <clears throat> in the reverse, if I start shoving electrons in or pulling holes out, that will cause a bunch of current to conduct across there. And then with each transistor, there's a thing called gain. And it really what that does is it tells you for every electron that I let travel through the base, I'm going to let, if it's got a gain of 10, I'm going to let 10 electrons travel from the emitter to the collector. <coughs> or if it's a gain of 20 or a gain of 40. So a transistor, initially they were uh, very commonly used as amplifiers. Take a very small, little, weak signal and use it to amplify into a much bigger signal. So if I could take a very small, little, weak radio, radio transmission, uh, electromagnetic pulse, and amplify it to something quite a bit bigger, then take and do some work um, massaging that, separate the signals out, and what's left over is, again, a very small signal. So we'll then amplify that up again with a couple of transistors and then use that to drive our speaker so we can hear what was actually said. <coughs> However, fairly quickly, we also figured out that if I take and tie this to one way, to ground, it'll turn off. If I tie it the other way, it'll turn on. So I can use this as a switch as a remote control switch. So with a very small amount of current, I can turn this thing on or off, which is ultimately what the circuit here does. What this circuit does is it says, unless I drop the resistance here to below this resistance, this guy will stay off. Otherwise, if I increase the resistance, this guy will turn on. Now I can reverse the way I'm doing that also. Um, <clears throat> but the important part is the amount of current that I'm going to sit, send through this voltage divider is a very small amount of current. Now, what's driving that little variable resistor there? We don't care. It could be some magic computer with millions and millions of circuits and wires and, lo and logic. <clears throat> what we care is it makes a decision to turn on the output device to turn this load on. Okay? <clears throat> almost always diagnostically, either power is bad, ground's bad, something's wrong with the load or the wires in between. <clears throat> this guy has failed. If this guy has failed or any of the magic behind it has failed, you're going to replace it all. However, I will tell you from experience, I have yet to find a, a blown out output transistor on an electronic magic box that just magically blew out on its own. Every single time, and it's been hundreds of them, uh, every single time the reason the output transistor fails is because there's something wrong with the rest of the circuit. The load has a partial short in it, somebody hooked a battery up backwards, something was done wrong. <coughs> those, those, those particularly output transistors are pretty robust. They typically do not fail on their own. So if you find yourself in that situation with a blown out trend, output transistor, uh, be cautious because if you throw a magic new box in there, you might be buying another one. <clears throat> All right, so I, then 
in the transistor, the um, nomenclature is really wonky. They, they came up with these terms, um, emitter and collector. You can see them up there. Uh, the, <coughs> the emitter will collect holes. Uh, no, excuse me. <coughs> the collector will collect holes or output electrons. So if, if I look at my ENP, PMP device here, um, whatever that is, <coughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll avoid the, whether it's an NPN or a PMP, I'm going to have a base controlling it in the middle region. The emitter will uh, either send out holes or take in um, electrons. <coughs> the collector, on the other hand, collects holes, positives, and sends out negatives. <coughs> So this means if you're going to have a power supply, you're going to want the negative on this side so that the negatives go this direction, right? Because we're always going to go negative to positive, and holes are going to go from positive to negative. So depending on whether it's an NPM or a PNP, I'm going to want the arrow to face the same way the arrow faces in a diode. What do we do to get the arrow and the uh, diode to conduct? We face the arrow from, I don't remember. What's the way to forward bias a diode? Which way do we face the arrow? We point the arrow from positive to negative. It will start conducting. <clears throat> so if we go back and look at the little arrows they did. <clears throat> now this is where it gets sort of weird. You see the little arrows they did. <clears throat> so this arrow shows the direction. If I make this positive, and I make um, this side negative, and I make this side a little bit negative, then electrons will travel from here through here like this, and they'll travel from this way out like that. Conversely, on the NPN, the arrow's facing the other direction. <clears throat> so uh, based on emitter and collector <clears throat> definitions, it's going to reverse on us. So if I make the arrow pointed this way towards negative, right? So this becomes positive. Electrons are going to travel against the direction of <clears throat> flow here. And because it's got P in the middle, I'm going to let some electrons come out of here to <clears throat> turn the thing on. That's kind of confusing vernacular, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't invent it. Um, I think if we had our, our logic or our theory right <laughs> in terms of which way electron travels, it would they would have done it slightly differently and it would have been easier to remember. But <clears throat> so, uh, I'm pretty sure, well, I don't remember if FA has any questions out there about emitter and collector and which is which. <clears throat> and of course, then on top of that, you've got to decide which is the anode and the cathode. It gets pretty confusing. We're not going to ever use that to fix an airplane. Okay. <clears throat> so... I don't know if you guys remember the days of vacuum tubes, but there were hundreds and thousands of different kinds of vacuum tubes that did not only did they have a bunch of them, the same type for different set, different ranges, but they had many, many different kinds for different purposes. <coughs> Diodes and transistors and sensors, etc. <coughs> well, the same thing is true here. We came up with a whole bunch of different kinds of transistors. So the last one that I showed you, the standard uh, uh, <clears throat> um, a standard transistor 
very commonly used on a lot of output heavy load devices. <clears throat> a more sensitive one is the junction field effect. So instead of just making three plates, they actually sort of make a little eye shape with a band of material around it. <clears throat> and then by taking and making <clears throat> the um, making this positive, then this center column will start to conduct. These guys don't um, they don't handle nearly as much power, but they're also way less um, likely to, to be disrupted by surrounding um, either static fields or electromagnetic fields. <coughs> so, if you have a very sensitive circuit, like a, a you know a fine audio circuit that's trying to refine things, uh, or maybe you're taking the initial signal off of a um, antenna head. You might use something like this. It's a lot more sensitive, but it, uh, it it's also not going to get um, it's not going to in, induce or entrain in um, additional noise from surrounding circuits. The other thing they did just to make things more confusing is they use different terms. <coughs> they replaced the term gate or base with gate. They re replaced the term um, uh, collector with source and emitter with drain. Uh, again, I'm not going to ever have you memorize that, but um, just know that for every one of these components that are out there that are manufactured by every manufacturer, so uh, TI makes a bunch of stuff, Intel makes a bunch of stuff and on and on and on. Each one of them has a spec sheet describing its function, its operation, its current values, its voltage values, etc. <coughs> You'll have to get on there and read. It'll give you a nice little narrative about it. So if you ever want to play with one of these, you, the, the upside of the internet is you can look all that stuff up. It's all there. Uh, then the last thing, which I thought we talked about last week, but I guess we didn't. Yeah, we did. We did? Yep. Oh. Well, why did you guys say something? You guys said we were somewhere else. So if we've talked about this last week, let me move on. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So the most important part about this, just to kind of briefly touch on it again quickly, is um, I don't know that I really care to figure out how that circuit works extensively. In almost all cases, this is going to be one device. I need to kind of know what its decision making is going to be. So based upon what these three values are doing, I should have some ex expected output. If I'm not getting that output, then the component's bad. <clears throat> but I don't care what's happening here because I'm going to I'm going to replace it all anyway. And in fact, when I look inside one of those, there's a whole bunch of different things inside it. Um, so then these right here become your basic building blocks for almost all digital lo logic. <clears throat> and that'll never, we, we don't need to go too deep into that. Um, then the last one, which uh, it seems like we talked about, <clears throat> but that, that triangle symbol, that's an example of all the circuits that are inside it. So you're going to see, we got one, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight transistors. <clears throat> Looks like about eight to ten resistors. Uh, a little Zener diode sitting there. Um, what else? I'm surprised there's not a filter cap in there somewhere. There might be. Can <coughs> <coughs> we call the cops off? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to die again. It's uh, just, it is what it is. I'm going to die. I'll go to my voice, can't go, and then we'll go to the <laughs> Yeah, because I thought we talked about this. So um, this is the mass soldering. This is pretty cool. That cool mirror right there is liquid molten solder. <clears throat> That's kind of cool. All right, so I think we talked about that. Did we get into wiring some at all? Yeah, we did. And watched a video too. Okay, so yeah, we, we, we ended right here. All right, I'm sorry. 
you guys over here told me we weren't quite there yet. All right. I thought that's where we ended was right here. Yeah, we watched. Right. We looked at that slide yeah, the presentation. Like a, and that like was a forty it. minute video or something. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we ended there. So my apologies. <coughs> um. So when you look at connecting strategies and wiring strategies, you're going to see so many different possible ways of doing this. I I can't tell you, you know, in a in a high level like this. What's the best connector that's out there? They're all different. They all serve different purposes. I can tell you that these the twist lock cannon metal type connectors, pretty pricey, pretty expensive, pretty good connector is probably the least likely to fail on you. On the other hand, they're heavy, they're expensive. So it depends on what you're building. <coughs> If my $400 million rocket ship is going to die because I, I got a bad connector in there, it's going to get 300 feet off the, uh, off the, uh, out of the launch pad and then blow up, then I probably want to put expensive connectors in there. On the other hand, if my, you know, my Chevy Nova is kind of like, hey, oh well, it dies. And Chevy Nova do that all the time anyways. I don't know, Chevy Nova's there, okay, I guess. Ford Pinto, there we go. That's when we know it's going to die. All right. Now, what is kind of interesting is is the way they build up, they build stuff up. <coughs> and I think I have another slide that will show this more in detail. Somebody goes through, an engineer goes through and lays out all the lengths of all the different wires. They then set up a breadboard with just you know dead end receptacles. They then go through and. Um, lace all the wires out and once they get all the wires laced out and built up like that somebody will then go through and form them all in form you know tighten them all up trip, trim them all off the exact same length <coughs> correctly strip them although they may already be done there um, and then put terminals on them and put a connector on them and then from there the whole thing has to be taken off and bolt it into um, whatever you're going to bolt it into. This usually happens before anything else is put in. So if you look at your car chassis, it goes through getting built, it then goes through the painting process, curing process, and the very next thing they put in is the wiring harness, almost always. Okay. Same thing with the engine. The engine gets put together, a whole bunch of stuff gets put on, and in fact, with the front axle drive systems, <clears throat> all the wheels and everything else are all put together along with the wiring harnesses. They're all put in and slid up into the vehicle, and everything's hooked up. With the airframe, <coughs> up until recently, the airframe was also done that way. You know, station 100 to station 190, or whatever the length of the fuselage section, that's built as a single piece with all the wiring harnesses and everything else in place. It's then put in place, and the next section of fuselage is plugged into it. Everything's all interconnected, and on and on and on. Um, the wings are screwed on, the tail feathers are screwed on, <coughs> with the wiring components usually already installed. Okay. So typically, we're going to see, I, I thought we touched on this too, but. Yeah, we did. So, then I'm gonna move you guys. Hold on, I know we talked about that, we talked about that, we talked about that, and then I'm gonna go with what I remember, rather. I remember we talked about pen misalignment. These guys, easy money. Easy money here. This is where you're going to make your money. <coughs> that number, I was being conservative. It's probably more like about 99% of all electrical failures occur. <coughs> Even the ones where a load device or some other device is damaged, it often occurs because an electrical connection was bad. In fact, with respect to wires, I've only had two occasions. Again, I'm going to exclude all those places where some idiot took a drill and drilled through the wiring room. Okay, that happens. But outside of mechanical damage, the only, I've only had two occasions where 
the wire itself failed from the inside. And on both occasions, it, you, as, when I split the wire, uh, the wire insulation open, it looked like things got too tight and some of the strands broke. They were all encased in plastic. And you could see where the plastic just filled in where there's only one or two strands left. Um, so otherwise, almost always, the problem is at the end of the wire. <clears throat> all right, so I think we then talked a little bit about that one, all the different connectors. I don't know that we got it. I know, we, yeah, I know we talked about that. I remember talking about that slide. <clears throat> I do want to quickly touch on that one, though. You guys, as as you've gone through the lab, you've already figured out it's kind of hard to strip a wire without nicking or tearing the wires. No, sure. Yeah, because mainly because you're giving us too little of the wire to begin with. I found that to be a, a well, really. What if you have a very small piece of wire that you need? No, just quit. Just quit. <laughs> <laughs> grumble, grumble, grumble. That's yeah. hilarious, dude. That's just quit. You know, <laughs> you wouldn't learn anything if I made it easy. That's the truth. <laughs> True story. Yeah. But truly, I want you guys to experience a little bit. It's it's a real pain in the butt to get yeah. to meet the FAA specification. Only four nicks. Maximum and that and with lower strand number of strands it's even less than that nothing broken off uh, It's pretty hard to do that All right, uh, so yeah, I think we talked a little bit about that. I remember showing you the wire. This is cool here <coughs> I will tell you with respect to labeling Most of the time <coughs> in the aviation industry we do a pretty good job of um, <clears throat> including a labeling number that sort of has meaning rather than just being some bizarre engineering number. It'll indicate something to do with the wire size, <clears throat> maybe the section of the, of the airplane it's in, or maybe like um, a, a, an alphanumeric that lets you know what system it is, charging system, landing light system, something like that. Um, Automotive industry, on the hand, other hand, uh, they're terrible. <clears throat> Housing industry, building industry, I mean, it's all Romex. Nothing's identified in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and it can be a real <laughs> royal thing. Airplanes actually are a little bit easier to work on. All right, so, and I think I showed you the chart here. And we looked at a few of these type of connectors. Assemblies. <clears throat> are zip ties allowed? Yes. yes. Are they the best way to go? No. It's, uh, I think there are times where it's appropriate. There are also times where do it the right way. So if I've got something going on like everything back here where I'm not going to be in there that much, not doing that much, lace it up. Do it correctly. On the other hand, if I'm doing some experimental work or, or <clears throat> some type of setup where I'm, I'm regularly going in there at least every annual or every once in a while, then maybe zip ties are appropriate. Um, I, I will say that lacing does a much better <coughs> job and um, is quite a bit lighter. I think we talked about this. The problem with spaghetti is good luck finding it that's aircraft uh, spaghetti. It's almost always going to be polyvinyl chloride which melt, begins to melt at about 250 degrees. It's just not acceptable. It also has a tendency to burn because it's a hydrocarbon, it's a petroleum product. So it has a tendency to burn and then produce toxic gases. So it doesn't belong on an airplane. Can you back up one slide? <coughs> huh? Can you back up one slide? Are you gonna show us that fancy knot? Oh, the lacing? Yeah. Uh, not in this class, but in the airplane class. We will just look at important stuff. Well, the, when you get to the airframe class, we will get to that. It's basically just a double, a double clove hitch with a double square knot. All right, double square. All right. Yeah. Were you in the Navy? Yeah. And you don't know what a clove hitch and a double square knot is? I forgot all that crap. Did they even teach you what a bowling is? Yeah. Yeah. 
who cares? I know I met a lot of Navy guys that couldn't tie a bowl and save their life. Who needs to tie that stuff? It's yeah, yeah. Navy, I don't need to know that. Yeah, I don't need to know so you're in the Navy, you damn well better know how to tie a bowl. Right? Unnecessary knowledge. One handed behind your back, the eyes closed. Not my job, it's somebody else's. Bosun mate. Bosun mate does that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mate. yeah. <laughs> um, some of these are sort of kind of duh, but we actually had to write regs and make procedures. <clears throat> Don't take your big electric wire and wrap it around the oxygen line or the the fuel line or any, you know, it's like, duh. <clears throat> Unfortunately, as certainly myself and as you saw in that one PowerPoint, um, the FAA has gone looking. You see stuff like that done all the time. <clears throat> I will tell you guys that as you get to working on airplanes, you train your eye to become better and better at seeing weird stuff like that stuff that's an anomaly. Um, and it takes time to develop that skill. <clears throat> but a big part of what you want to do is to develop that skill to be able to say, oh, that isn't done right. <clears throat> um, then between points, we're going to want a little bit of flexibility. I think we talked about that. Don't remember if we've gotten up there. Yeah, I think we talked a little bit about just in pair. <clears throat> so buses, have we jumped into buses yet? That may have been where we quit. Uh, we haven't been there yet. Okay. So buses. That, but... Not something made by Bluebird or Thomas. Okay. Could be spelled with a single S or a double S. I actually spent a little bit of time trying to decide which, and it's all over the map. <clears throat> so there's a good side to a bus and a bad side to a bus. The good side to the bus is it provides a way of spreading the circuit out bring ground into one place, and then make a bunch of easily attached points to ground or to power distribution. <clears throat> the downside of the bus is if the bus breaks or that one big wire breaks, then everything gets taken offline, right? So you lose a little bit of redundancy with a bus. <clears throat> so as such, you see these two big buses there, and they're sort of standalone components. Another way you sometimes see this done in aviation is we'll take a whole row of components like circuit breakers, and the hot side of the circuit breaker will take a copper strip and drill nice, clean, evenly spaced holes and just screw that copper strip to the distribution side of the circuit breakers, and that becomes your bus. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So there's a variety of different strategies. <clears throat> At the end of the day, you're going to go to what what document to find out the appropriate 4313? washers and lock washers and How many types of metals. Stacks? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Typically, although I've seen this violated by the manufacturer, you don't want more than four connections per lug. That, again, it's a redundancy thing. They're just reducing the number of things that get taken offline if the screw comes loose. All right. Uh, so it's fairly common to see buses divided out. So note how this sort of shows a primary bus. That's kind of the main thing. It looks like we've got uh, fuel quantity indicators, strobe lights, landing lights. Uh, starter circuit, wing, wing flaps, etc. Then they take and bring a separate circuit off to here. And it's kind of interesting that this one doesn't have a switch in it. Oftentimes they'll put a switch between the two. <coughs> and so in this case, it's the avionics bus. So all the avionics, the NAVCOM, GPS, all the rest of that stuff will come off the avionics bus. Another fairly common one is going to be a lighting bus. Okay, So all I have to do is hit one switch, and now all my nav lights are on, extra rotating beacons, etc. Maybe not turned on, but I powered up the cabin lighting. And then I have uh, another switch to turn the cabin lighting up or down. Um, the advantage of that is you get to, what is it, half hour before sunrise, sunset, click that on, now you're legal. 
<clears throat> so, and again, all of this is appropriate to the amount of current being carried <clears throat> by the system. Now, typically, they way overbuild the bus. So, let's say the you know the bus has a number eight wire coming in. Well, the number eight wire is you know, you know, about that thick. Okay, the bus that it goes to is a big copper slab, which has way way more current carrying capacity than the wire feeding current in. <coughs> the reason they make it bigger is because you need to have room for all the different screws that go in there and all the different connectors. The other thing that you guys have already started to note is all of the crypt type connectors, they're not very symmetrical. In other words, where the ring sits, you now have a barrel. So you, you can't really stack them on top of each other. You have to sort of stagger them off a little bit. So instead of stacking them like this, you got to stagger them off just a little bit. Well, there's only a couple of those you can do before you start running yeah, into other things, right? <coughs> The other thing that will be common among some buses, particularly positive power buses, is not only will they have a bunch of screws, but they'll have a little individual part of the, the insulator will have little plates separating the, the different components on the bus so that there's less likelihood of something bridging two, sec two sections of the circuit. What do you mean? Like, could you show some example? What do you mean? Uh, I may be able to. And <clears throat> if I've got one here. But for example, you know, I might have a bus plate like this with a screw to screw. And then they just have part of the insulating plate sits right between them. There's a metal connector in between. And then if I want to make these common, they make a little plate that jumps over that sits on there and it catches both of those screws. So you can connect all of these together, or I can have 10 here that are 12 volt, <coughs> uh, you know, five that are five volt, etc. So the better bus assemblies allow you to actually modify and make it um, appropriate to the job being solved. So this one here looks kind of like a homemade one. Probably will work. Insulator plate, the copper bus here. <clears throat> Looks like a cover guard. Here's where, remember that where I said they just took copper bar and interconnected all the circuits? So it's a little hard to see, but you can see this comes in and interconnects all the way to here, all the way to here, and there's several other power leads, and it ends here. That's all one bus, right? This is all one bus. Um, this is a separate bus. So all this is one bus. That's a separate bus. This portion here is one bus. This portion here looks to be one bus as well. <coughs> so in this assembly, they've got four or five different uh, bus assemblies. I can't tell you what they're all for, but. So and I've already said that. Um, <coughs> uh, again, truly the downside of this is they do reduce redundancy. So if something damages, if something shorts here, and you have to turn that circuit off, look at all the different circuits you're turning off. Okay? All of that gets turned off because you had a problem with one. Whereas here, you only lose three things. Okay. And this is a pretty clean installation. They use zip ties, which, you know, I guess, <clears throat> particularly given how it's built, it's a little hard to get in there and do the tying. Um, I might have actually done some lacing in through here. <coughs> uh, okay. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not uncommon to see that type of scenario where, <clears throat> you know, your avionics are set up, you get in the airplane, you uh, 
you're in a, a, a radar environment. So you're getting ready to take off. <clears throat> you get in the airplane, turn the master switch on, turn the avionics on. You call up, uh, you know, uh, SoCal Tracon. You say, I'm at Lindbergh Field. I'm such and such airplane. I want a radar clearance to Catalina departure, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> they give you a bunch of instructions. You say, thank you very much. Make notes, do your read back. Then you shut the avionics bus all the way off again. One switch, everything's turned off. Then go through starting the engine, doing all of that business. <clears throat> then when you're ready to call ground and taxi, avionics bus back on, flip to the right frequency. <clears throat> that way you're not turning on a hundred different radios or and components. Okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether or not you should ground through the airplane. There's some places where you don't have a choice. Okay. Almost always, generators and alternators ground through the engine chassis. What they're bolted onto. Starters do as well. <coughs> well, at some point, you're going to have to take a ground from the engine back to the airframe. Right? Uh... What I would say is current is less of an issue as long as it's a good solid ground. Now, I, I caution you. I have seen people take, like, scrape off the insulation on an engine mount and use a hose clamp to clamp a ground strap to the engine mount. That's not acceptable. I've also <laughs> seen take, people take fairly large heavy-duty wire and, say, like an AN3 or an AN4 bolt, a quarter inch or a 3 16th bolt, with a small lug and tie that big 300 amp wire to a stainless steel firewall that's, you know, 20,000 material. Okay, and the immediate ring around there, there isn't enough material to handle 300 amps. And that's going to become a hot spot. I've actually seen firewalls charred a little bit from that. If you're going to tie it to anything, tie it to one of the bolts that, that's attached to the, the engine mount, the bird cage that then is tied to very substantial structure of the airplane. Um, in general, I worry less about current, high current. High voltage, on the other hand, creates all kinds of interference. So what makes high voltage? Well, anytime you have a radio transmitter, that makes pretty high voltage. Anytime you have a light, a strobe light of some kind, it's going to make pretty high voltage. Okay. So those guys that might be in your best interest to actually bring the ground <clears throat> as all the way back to as close to the battery as you can. Now the other one that's going to be really uh, that you really have to be careful about are very sensitive lines, like the microphone lines on, on communications. Microphones don't produce a lot of current. <clears throat> so those are going to need to be appropriately and correctly shielded. Um, and that shielding and in fact, many radios have a very specific, what's called an isolated shielding ground in the radio. They, it's not the ground that you use to go to chassis. If you measure with an ohm meter, the ohm meter will make, make it seem like it's just a regular ground, but it's not. It's a very specific ground <coughs> that's tied back to the original amplifier of the microphone. Um, if a radio has a separate, you know, a lead, the, the manual shows a microphone ground coming out, Make sure your microphone grounds and shielding goes to that lead there, not to just a generic ground, or you'll end up with some noise. Is the noise caused by going going to ground? Mm -hmm. Is it the the, the the background static is is from the uh, improper ground? Is that what you're saying? Uh, it could be from an improper ground, or it could be just from stuff on the ground, on the, you know, voltage <laughs> surging through the chassis of the airframe. Okay. okay. <coughs> if the ground path for the microphone or for the shielding has to go through a ground chassis that has a bunch of voltage on it, mm -hmm. then that's just going to act like an antenna for it, okay. right? As opposed to it going all the way back to the ground lug on the radio, which is tying that right back to the amplifier ground, mm -hmm. right after. There's nothing, there's no, none of this other mm -hmm. noisy stuff happening on it. Um, <clears throat> so yes, separate 
Also, anything that transmits data, whether it's a microphone, a data line, VOR data, GPS data line, antenna coaxial antenna line, those all need to be kept separated from big current producers. Okay, positive, negative to anything. All right, switch to. <coughs> well, if you thought there were a lot of different kinds of connectors, let me tell you, there's about 15 different, 15 times as many different kinds of switches out there. Um, Human interface devices. Let's see, eight. Uh, there's about 20 there. I got four there. A double one there. There's one there. A couple of ones here. One right there. And I just, you know, I'm still in one little area. Once I get to one of your computers, I'm going to get to 130 there. <clears throat> all little bitty switches. <clears throat> Almost always, switches fall into two categories. In a way, you could sort of say it's one category, but they fall into two categories. One is a human interface device. You're going to go on off for whatever reason, right? The second one is we're, we're going to use it as a position sensor, some type of a sensor that tells us the gear are up, tells us the gear are down, tells us the door is open, tells us the door is closed, <clears throat> tells us to trigger the alarm or not trigger the alarm. Now, you could... Technically, you say the switch that's being used as the human interface device is, in fact, a sensor. It's just sensing that the human has said, do something. <clears throat> they make sort of two groups of them. <clears throat> the mechanical switch, big, huge, bodacious mechanical switch. Um, another big, huge, bodacious one. Or they make them solid state, where what we have in here, in this particular one, <clears throat> is a, um, an electronic relay, big power transistors, connecting this lead to that lead, that lead to that lead, and that lead to that lead. So that's three phases. Three phase, 480 volt, 60 amp switch. If I take and make this positive or negative and that positive with it looks like 32 volts, this switch will turn on a three phase device, right? say a three phase motor. Okay, it's electronic. There's no mechanical points or anything in here. Now, the difference between these two switches here and this switch right here, and really that one, uh, is this one is what? Mechanical. mechanical. <coughs> no, they're both mechanical. Mechanical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mechanical. Yeah. Why is this one different? Rotate. Well, okay, these sort of rotate. But what does this provide that, that the others don't provide? Which is really important. Show it. it could have that, but when I open a switch or when I close a switch, what always happens? Oh, you, know, spark. Spark. you get a spark, right? Mm -hmm. Always get a spark at, the, at any voltage. It so might be a really microscopic spark. That one is enclosed. That one's enclosed and sealed. So if there's any combustible vapors around, this one will be a lot harder for it to make the boom go boom. Right. Those ones, the boom can go boom pretty easily. Right. Right? In the world of aviation, the very first base <clears throat> limited, you know, you cannot violate this rule for switches is they must be sealed. Ab gas is really, really volatile and explosive. So if it's going to be in an airplane, <clears throat> um, yeah, does Home Depot claim that all their switches are sealed? Probably. <sighs> believe it? No. Yeah, you need aircraft grade stuff to be used. <clears throat> so, again, a, a variety, here's a variety of different switches. Um, these are all typically sensor type switches. Some roller or something hits this and clicks it. Same thing here. Those actually might be switches that humans would use. Human toggle switch. Push button, push button. Here we're looking more like sensor or limit switches of some type. Here's a limit one where <clears throat> you can see as it goes down, 
This cam comes down, pushes it on here, and eventually the points go from here to there. <clears throat> so in the switch vernacular, we're going to say that there's an interconnection between the lead on the left and one of the other two leads. So, and we're going to say that when the switch is in a sprung, relaxed condition, it's normal. That's its normal position. Okay. So with respect to this contact, when the switch is normal, this is normally closed. When the contact is, or when the switch is not relaxed, it's open. Okay. So here it's normally closed. Here it's normally open when the switch is relaxed. So the term normal is referring to its relaxed position. Now, some switches that aren't, uh, that aren't momentary, <clears throat> they don't have a normal position. They're either one way or the other or one of multitudes of different ways. But a switch that has a spring-loaded uh, momentary action, normal is its relaxed state. And again, we can, in this particular case, we can wire it either way. It's very common for switches to be sold with all three leads, but they're only meant to be... <clears throat> But you could you, you could use all three of them or just two of them. What's, what's the purpose of the roller? Uh, we don't know, but let's say what's coming up to it is moving, okay? Or it's a cam that's rolling, and it hits it, you know. <clears throat> so it's not just a straight contact like this, but it's rolling along it. So there's some examples of limit switches. <clears throat> Here's one that is this as this joint flexes right here. This joint flexes up this way. Well, as it comes down like this and straightens out, <clears throat> this switch eventually makes contact. This little adjustable uh, pad right here runs into the switch, and it either goes from open to closed, or from closed to open. We don't we don't know until we look it up. Uh, in this one, it looks like what we've got is the limit travel switch on a, um, on a mill bed. Okay, maybe on the x-axis of the mill. <clears throat> the mill will go and come to a stop. Okay. Here, I don't know, I'm going to guess hanger door. The hanger door comes up to a point where that goes, and this is where that roller. The roller hits there and it starts riding until it comes up to there and goes click and finally shuts off. Before the hanger door winds all the way up and breaks all the gears and comes crashing back down. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, well, it's hard to define, you know, any universal rules about solid state controllers. There are some basics that we can we can sort of throw out there. First off, and whatever the magic is that's happening inside, okay, suffice to say it's there. Most of us at the field level are not going to need to know it. We're going to need to know a few things. We're going to kind of need to know what its inputs are and what its expected outputs are. Okay. <clears throat> so let's use a car as an example. What are some of the expected inputs? Well, it should have 12 volts and it should have ground, right? It's going to need to know mm, whether the engine is running or not. <clears throat> a good reason for that is going to be, let's say you're in the situation where the key is turned on, but you've had an accident, and the engine isn't running, but the computer still has the fuel pump on. Is that a good thing? No. No. So we want the, the computer to say, engine isn't running, and it might even take it a little bit further. Let's say you have uh, airbags. It says, okay, airbags have been deployed. We want the fuel pump turned off. So it'll turn it off. However, there may be another thing that says, well, look, wait a minute. Before we get this engine started, <clears throat> we've got to turn the fuel pump on enough to just get the fuel pressure up a little bit. So then what the computer would say is to say, all right, I need a starter input. When the starter gets activated, um, so what I'm going to do is when the ignition for or when the key first comes on, 
I'm going to turn the fuel pump on briefly. Then I'm going to turn it off. Then I'm just going to sit there until I hear the, see the starter come on. When the starter comes on, I'll turn the fuel pump back on. Because now I know the engine's being cranked. And then as soon as I start getting my crank reference sensor that tells me the engine is spinning, <clears throat> I'll leave the fuel pump turned on. Okay, so that's the kind of magic that's happening here. From our perspective, all we need to know is not how it's doing it, but what information it needs. Okay, so it needs to know something from the starter. It needs to know something that from the engine that it's running. <clears throat> of course, another thing it might use the crank reference sensor for is to know how fast the engine's spinning, or specifically what position it is relative to top dead center for number one cylinder. <clears throat> On the output side, turns the fuel pump on. Maybe it turns the injector on and off for the fuel injector. Maybe it fires all the spark plugs, turns the ignition coils on and off. Okay. Maybe it activates anti-lock braking when you slam on the brakes and you're sliding down the road. And wheel sensors say wheels are starting to decelerate inappropriately. <clears throat> All of that's fairly easy to figure out, and in almost mm. every case, the sensing devices are pretty uniform. Okay, they have some variable resistances. Occasionally, there'll be a little bit of digital data, but most of the time, it's variable re voltages or variable resistances. Um, <coughs> the other thing that's very, very common with these computers, because of the fact that we design circuits to be the, the brain circuits operate on the positive side of the you know, We feed power to them, and then they somehow have to activate a device with a transistor. Well, remember we talked about the PMPs and the NPNs. Because the controlling circuits are on the positive side and their output is going to be positive, we want to feed that to an NPN so that I can feed the P a little bit of positive to turn it on. But for the NPN to work, the emitter and collector relationship, it has to be on the negative side of the load. <clears throat> so it's just we, just, we pick that. For whatever reason, we pick that. The end result is almost all big output transistors. These really big guys right here, they're all NPNs. And, and our mass manufacturing intends to build those for output devices. So we just just like we chose to go with 12 volt batteries rather than 8 volt batteries or 16 volt batteries. We pick something, right? <clears throat> um, so it's fairly common <clears throat> to um, to be able to open the lid and look in here and see where your output devices are and then you know follow the traces back and figure out a little bit about the circuit. But the truth is you don't really care. If I open that box up and I look in here and I see a bunch of smoke <clears throat> sitting right there, a bunch of fried fried cookies right there, I'm going to say, okay, something went wrong and something overloaded this thing. Uh, <clears throat> we're not going to stick a new one in until we can figure out what it was that overloaded it. <clears throat> Last thing in the world you want is the customer to spend thousands of dollars and then a week later, come back having to spend another couple of thousand dollars. Um, that's they're, 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 you're not going to keep that customer. <clears throat> all right. Um, typically, about all you can do is replace these guys. Uh, I will say though, I've done a fair number of repairs to these circuit boards, primarily just cracked solder joints. <coughs> you can do uh, fairly readily do that. Um, I guess what I'll say is the kind of components that are, you know, it, it's, it's almost always a manufacturing flaw. Remember that, that wave soldering thing I showed you? Cheaper processes don't actually preheat all the circuits, preheat all the components. They use a low end thing. <coughs> so you end up with a lot of solder, crack soldering lines. The problem is if I go buy something, if I got something that's got, you know, commonly has cracked solder joints, I go through and repair all the cracked solder joints, it probably will work again, but they've probably done, gone cheap on everything else, so it may not last that long. 
Now, every once in a while you get a one-off where that's a situation you can repair it and everybody's good, but <clears throat> I found more often than not, just replace them. That said, there's nothing wrong with, you know, going, okay, it's got a cracked solder joint. I know there's a problem here. Take a picture, show the customer. This is why we're trying to use nine hours because it took me that long to figure it out. Yeah, this is what the problem was, etc. <clears throat> All right. And I, I just, I cannot say that enough. Anytime the solid state controller is gone, belly up, make sure the outputs aren't overloading it. Um, <clears throat> again, really piss poor design. <coughs> Cracked and broken uh, leads there. Why are those failed? What is the problem with this picture? Everything. Touching it. Huh? And I formally complained with the FAA on this one. This is a certified product in certified airplanes. And here's the part that's really mind boggling. It's a little hard to see in this picture, but that little ridge right there, there's a big hole right there. <clears throat> there's also another one right there. Big solder pad hole right there. If they had used the correct RS-232 connector, it would have a part that comes down into there and it's soldered to the board, big substantial solder, rather than relying on these nine pinky little copper pins <coughs> to withstand the weight of not only that connector, but the part of the connector that goes on to it, that's sitting on the back bouncing around, okay, vibrating with engine vibration. Okay. Now, <clears throat> had I gotten a better response from the manufacturer of the component, oh, wow, we didn't realize it was, yeah, let's get on that. But it was, nah, it's not a problem. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay, fine. We'll see what the FAA has to say, which is my response to it. You guys have clearly done something really, really stupid. Um, so I filled out a thing called the Service Difficulty Report. <clears throat> now, I don't know that anything became of it, but I recommended in the bottom of it, recommendation for repair <clears throat> was a, an emergency AD on all of these components and have them taken out of service until it was. <clears throat> now, is this a critical component? Fuel indicating device, eh, maybe, maybe not. I never saw an AD come back around, but um, but to me, that's just flat cheesy. I <clears throat> never, ever should have done that. Um, okay, uh, static protection. Slide. One more slide like this. <clears throat> so, if you see a component that you're going to install that comes in this funky plastic foil stuff, presume that your static electricity that's sitting on you or anything around you can damage the component. Okay? <coughs> that means at the very least, before you pull this thing out of the bag and stick it onto something, Ground yourself to the something. Get at least somewhat neutralized with it. Now, the better way of doing that is, see how this guy has some static band, wristbands, and he's grounded to the ground plane that he's working on? He also has some other uh, environmental uh, clothes on to prevent hair and other debris <clears throat> from falling down inside those components. Um, so, but any anytime you see that kind of foil or this kind of pink foam that's static, anti-static, what that does is it um, any any voltage that gets picked up from rubbing, from friction, etc., it just grounds it, it dissipates it. Okay, one of the most significant voltage generators is called plastic. The common idiot public, they think the safest thing in the world you can do to use to handle fuel in is a plastic jerry can. Because they're not conductive, right? How could you get a spark? They're not conductive. Static. And well, that's exactly the problem. They're not very conductive, but they love to develop friction. Well, what are you doing when you start pouring gasoline out the nozzle? Out the nozzle? Generating friction. Aren't you generating friction? Yeah. <clears throat> so you're sitting there pouring, and this thing's getting more and more charge and more and more charge, and pretty soon the nozzle goes 
gets right next to the side and goes click and a little spark. Right where you got all these fumes coming out because you're pouring gas in. Yeah, I've see, personally seen that happen. What would you recommend then? Big alligator clamp with big wire to gas can Grounded. to airplane. Yeah. Grounded. Grounded. Then pour fuel in. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, there's a sort of misleading thing that plastic isn't, uh, because plastic isn't conductive, it's, a pro it's not a problem. It's the other way around. <clears throat> and what they've done with this plastic is they've they made it conductive. They've made this conductive. They've made this rubber conductive so that any voltage that tries to build up we'll just back. dissipates. Yeah. Doesn't get to be very high, high voltage. Now, the other thing they can do with these stupid little pieces of electronic solid state controllers <clears throat> is they can put them in places that are incredibly difficult to get to. Um, uh, <coughs> they do it for two reasons. In the automotive industry, <coughs> they do it, uh, well, <coughs> in both industries, they do it because of, they're trying to keep it cool, they're trying to keep it uh, from physical harm, people stepping on them, that type of thing. They also have a tendency in the automotive industry to hide them from people. <clears throat> because anytime anything goes wrong, and you guys have all probably done it yourself, what's the first thing you think? Stupid computer control. I hate computerized. Stupid computer control must be wrong. Okay, never, it rarely is the computer control. But. <coughs> And oftentimes when it is the computer control, it's not, it's because there's something badly designed about it rather than the components itself. Um, so these guys, this one's sort of up under the panel somewhere. These guys typically are not field repairable. In fact, in some cases, they're bonded, potted together in such a way that, you you know, you'd have to cut it in half to get it open. Um, they, uh, they can be pricey. All right, so let's stop here. Uh, how about we come back at, say, 11.30?